Hi, I'm Carolyn Gage and I live in Southwest Harbor. This is a recording of the presentation I did for the Bar Harbor Historical Society in June 2023. I'll be talking about the Bar Harbor section of the Lesbian History Trail of Mount Desert Island. So what is the Lesbian History Trail? Well, it was my pandemic project in 2020. I live in Southwest Harbor and I'm a professional playwright. The pandemic closed theaters all over the world and I was feeling pretty much out of a job. And one of the things I had noticed living here is the number of famous women who had summer homes or year round homes on this island and how many of them were lesbians. So I decided to make a website about these women and do it in the format of a self-guided tour around the island. So that is what the Lesbian History Trail of Mount Desert Island is. So let's get started. So this is the splash page of the website and there are 17 lesbians of historical note on it. So I'll just run through their names quickly. On the top row, we have Edith Hamilton, Eleanor Mayo, Grace Frick, Jane Adams, Mary Rose Smith, Marguerite Yorsenar. The middle row, we have Clara B. Spence, Ruth Moore, Charlotte Baker, Anne Longfellow Thorpe, Louise Gilbert, and LaRue Spiker. The bottom row, we have Frances Keller, Renee Vivian, Natalie Barney, Mary Dreyer, and Doris Fielding Reed. The website has brief biographies of the women, the fun stories of their personal lives, self-guided maps of the trail, and a list of resources, the historical resources here on the island, including the Bar Harbor Historical Society. Now, the first link on this page is the historical definition, which these days is a good place to start. What is a lesbian? This can be something of a touchy subject, especially on a small island and especially among families. So I went to an authority for answers. Dr. Lillian Faderman is an American historian whose books on lesbian history and LGBT history have earned critical praise and awards. The New York Times named three of her books on its notable books of the year list. Dr. Faderman has been referred to as, quote, the mother of lesbian history, end quote for her groundbreaking research and writings on lesbian culture, literature, and history. This is what she has to say about the word lesbian. Quote, lesbian describes a relationship in which two women's strongest emotions and affections are directed toward each other. Sexual contact may be a part of the relationship to a greater or lesser degree, or it may be entirely absent, end quote. Okay, so now that we've cleared that up, let's get started. So this is a map of the entire lesbian history trail. It has three sections, Eastern, Central, and Western. This talk today is about the Eastern section, which has to do with Bar Harbor. The Central, the central section does a loop from Route 3 down to Petit Plaisance, the home of Marguerite Yorsenar and Grace Frick in Northeast Harbor. Uh, with a peak out to Greening Island, the summer home of Anne Longfellow Thorpe, and then a scenic trip up Sargent Drive and a final destination at the Brookside Cemetery. The western section goes from the Flying Mountain parking lot at Fernal Point to Long Pond Road, the Harbor House in Southwest Harbor, down to the seawall, over to the Lighthouse, and it ends at Tremont Historical Society, visiting the homes and home sites of eight lesbians. But this today is the Eastern segment, and we're just going to be doing two thirds of it because I have so much to say. Um, it starts in Grant Park, and it makes a big loop up to Hull's Cove, over to the Stone Barn, and it ends at the Kibo Valley Club, pretty much taking you back to downtown. The lesbian couples who lived on this loop are Renee Vivian, Natalie Barney, Clara B. Spence, Charlotte Baker, Jane Adams and Mary Rose Smith, and today we will be talking about the first four. All right, so let's talk about the first four. Uh, the first couple we're looking at are Natalie Barney in the hat and Renee Vivian. Uh, 
Natalie Barney was a playwright and an author, but she is most famous for her salon in Paris. Now, I want you to just imagine that you are giving a party in your home tonight from 4 until 7. Um, there's going to be anywhere between 40 and 200 people. You're going to provide all the food and the drinks, yes, alcoholic, for everybody. And, um, and these people are not just, you know, neighbors. These are the brightest, most famous, cleverest, funniest, wittiest writers, artists, and celebrities in Maine and even beyond. Now, you're going to do that this Friday and then every single Friday for the rest of your life for 60 years. So when I say Natalie Barney was a famous salonist, don't be thinking, what's the big deal about throwing a party? Um, she threw that party every Friday for 60 years. And her salon brought together writers and artists from around the world, including many leading figures in French literature, along with American and British modernists of the lost generation. It would be difficult to overestimate the impact of these salons on American and European literature. And we're going to be looking at how Bar Harbor may have been the inspiration behind this life work. Renee Vivian was a poet, born in England, but living her adult life in France and choosing to write in French. She was the first lesbian to translate the poems of Sappho, a project she was working on during her stay on Kibo Street in the summer of 1900. Unlike the other couples on the lesbian history trail, Natalie and Renee were not life partners. They were together on and off for just a few short and tumultuous years before Renee died. So what is the MDI connection? Natalie Barney came, Marty, Barney came from a wealthy industrialist family, and they had built a summer cottage. And I say cottage in quotes because if you live on the island, you know that these um, wealthy um, summer people, their idea of a cottage would have up to 30 or 40 rooms. So Natalie's far family had built a cottage in 1888 when Natalie was 12, and every summer after that, the Barney family would spend their summer in Bar Harbor. Natalie and Renee would fall in love in Paris in 1900. No, that's not true. It was the year before. They fell in love in 1899, and Natalie would persuade Renee to cross the ocean with her to spend the summer with her in 1900. And this summer in Bar Harbor was a turning point in their volatile relationship, as we shall see. So here we have Natalie dressing up like a medieval page for her portrait. Uh, she looks like she's about 12 or something. Natalie's father was the son of a man who made a fortune building railroad cars. Having inherited a fortune... Her father decided he didn't have to, and he wasn't going to work for a living. And that was handy because actually he was a pretty serious alcoholic. Natalie's mother, Alice, realized soon after her marriage that her husband was an abusive tyrant. By this time, she was pregnant with Natalie, and divorce was unthinkable in her social circles. So she managed to travel and live in separate places from her husband as much as she could. Natalie, when she was 10, was sent to a boarding school in Paris called Les Rouches, or The Hive, that was headed up by Marie Souvestre. And it was here that Natalie developed her passion for poetry and an affinity for France. Madame Souvestre was an extremely influential lesbian who was in a not very closeted relationship with one of the teachers at the school. Later, she would go on to found a school in England that would be attended by Eleanor Roosevelt. Eleanor kept a photograph of Madame Sylvester by her bed her entire life. Obviously, she had a big influence on, on her, as she also had on Natalie. And here we see young Natalie riding side saddle. A little more about the side saddle later. This could have been taken in Bar Harbor. And here we see an adolescent Natalie posing semi-naked in some kind of animal skins. Why? Well, maybe it was to scandalize the family. She did a lot of that. But also, remember, the summer people on MDI were very fond of costume balls as well as a form of recreation called tableau vivant, where people would pose in costumes as famous 
paintings or scenarios from history. Um, and these could be quite risque and I find it amusing. They weren't considered, um, they weren't considered prurient if you didn't move. So uh, I guess that was the boundary. This could have been a costume from a tableau vivant. Anyway, they also love to do amateur theatricals and this may have been a costume from a play. And there's another picture of Natalie in her late teens, again, posing in costume, again, as a medieval page. Natalie as a young woman posing in her underwear. Um, and this is a surprisingly contemporary looking portrait of Natalie wearing some kind of knee breeches. This would have been in the late 1900s, close to the Bar Harbor summer we're going to talk about. She was very fond of romantic cross-dressing in male clothing from earlier eras. This is a studio photograph of Natalie taken in 1898, just two years before the fateful summer in Bar Harbor. And this is a photograph of Natalie in 1899, the year before she met Renee. Um, and well, it's the year she met Renee and a year before they came to Bar Harbor. That's Natalie on the right with her famous cloud of blonde frizzy hair. On the left is Leanne de Pugy, her first girlfriend. Leanne de Pugy was older than her, and she was a very famous courtesan in Paris. A courtesan was a prostitute for extremely wealthy men, including aristocrats, royalty, politicians, ambassadors, or bankers. The status of a courtesan could be very lofty, even when her reputation was not. At the turn of the century, women had very little freedom. They lived under the rule of either their fathers or their husbands. The law made them literally minors, children in terms of their rights. They couldn't own property and so on. Uh, Natalie saw this up close and personal with her own tyrannical father and his abuse of her mother. In comparison, courtesans had freedom. They controlled their own rates and their own working conditions, and they owned their own money, which they managed as they pleased. Um, media figures before their time, these women amassed substantial fortune, fortunes, and they displayed them by having luxury mansions built or by buying large properties in the countryside. They were empowered in significant ways that women with good reputations were not. Born into poverty but educated in a convent, Leanne was married off to a naval officer when she was a teenager. Her husband was older and extremely abusive. After he shot her in the back, Leanne realized if she didn't leave, he absolutely was going to murder her. After the divorce, her reputation, not his, was ruined. She tried to support herself with piano lessons but eventually became a courtesan. Natalie, barely an adult, was desperate to save Leanne. She felt enraged that people considered Leanne dishonorable for leaving a man who shot her. Natalie had rented a house in France where the two women could live together. Leanne, however, was not so eager to be rescued. She had known poverty as a child, as Natalie had not. Natalie was roman a romantic, but Leanne understood brutally the practicalities of life and she understood that her financial security depended on her continued work as a prostitute. She also understood that her youth and her looks would not last forever. Finally, a suitor offered Leanne half a million francs if she would leave Natalie, and she took it, and she left. Natalie was devastated. After they broke up, Leanne wrote a novel about her affair titled Sapphic Idol. It was published in 1901, the year after Natalie brought Renee to Bar Harbor. And it was such a success, it was reprinted 70 times in the first year. Everybody in Paris, and soon everybody in the world, knew that the lover in the book, Flossie, was actually Natalie Barney. And Natalie enjoyed the notoriety. First, it enraged her father, so that was a big win for Natalie. And she also discovered that people only gossip about you if you have a secret. She also discovered you can only lose your reputation once, and then you're done. So having established a thoroughly bad reputation at 20, Natalie could take advantage of the freedom that gave her, um, 
such a interesting life uh, after that and a long life. Besides, if her father was an example of what it meant to be a respectable member of high society, Natalie did not think very much of it. The year of her breakup with Leanne was 1899. Natalie on the rebound was about to meet the second great love of her life, another woman she would try and fail to rescue. So let's talk about Renee Vivienne. This is a photograph of Renee as a teenager, looking very dreamy. And here she is possibly still a teenager. Renee also came from upper class wealth like Natalie. She was born in England and her father died when she was only nine. This is an important part of her story. Her parents, like Natalie's, did not have a good marriage either. When her father died, he left all of his money for Pauline to inherit when she turned 21. He did not leave anything to his wife. Pauline had a turbulent adolescence, running away from home on one occasion and possibly attempting suicide on another. When she was still a teenager, her mother had her committed to a mental asylum, which was truly a horrible place in the 19th century. Maybe her mother really feared for her sanity, but it's also likely this was a way of getting around the terms of the will. If Pauline was in a mental asylum, she would never in the eyes of the law be considered an adult. When she turned 21, all of the money she was set to inherit would um, be under the guardianship of her mother, who would be her legal custodian. Pauline, in a courageous and unusual move for an inmate of an asylum, hired an attorney and sued her mother. The court sided with her and she was released to the care of a court-appointed guardian. In other words, she was, as we say now, emancipated as a minor. When she came of age, she was independently wealthy and immediately moved to France, where she took the name Renée Vivienne, a name that meant reborn to life. Renée moved to a room in a boarding house in Paris where she lived without a chaperone, and that was enough to ruin her reputation. But like Natalie, she didn't care. By then, Natalie was also living in Paris, having just broken up with Leanne, and Renee was introduced to Natalie by mutual friends, and they began to date. So here we have two insanely rich, very young women with unhealed trauma histories and destroyed reputations. What could possibly go wrong? So this is from a series of odd costume portraits that were taken with Natalie when they first got together in 1899. This is Renee looking like an 18th century young man. She apparently liked to cross dress as much as Natalie. And uh, again, with the cost, same costume shoot. And again, same costume shoot. And here's Renee with Natalie. Um, and they are striking a pose from the previous century. Uh, they actually look like they're getting ready for the French Revolution. So the summer of 1900, Renee and Natalie came to Bar Harbor, or Eden as it was then called, but there was trouble in paradise right from the get-go. So how did they get here? Well, they took an ocean liner from Paris, and during the crossing there were two major red flags. First, Natalie discovered a stash of prescrip prescription sedatives that Renee had smuggled on board. These were chloral hydrate pills, highly addictive and deadly. Historically, chloral hydrate was a drug used to make a Mickey Finn, um, the drink that would knock the drinker unconscious. Who else abused chloral hydrate? Marilyn Monroe, Hank Williams, Mary Todd Lincoln, and it was one of the drugs used in the Jonestown mass murder suicides. At the turn of the century, it was used to treat insomnia. And that's why Renee had the prescription, but she had promised she would not bring them with her. Uh, and yet, there they were. The second red flag was that Renee had left all of her evening clothes behind in Paris. She said she forgot to bring, bring the trunk that they were in. This was her excuse not to attend any social events. 
Renee was a huge introvert, and it's just very likely she left the tr trunk behind on purpose. Natalie sent a telegram from the boat to Paris and had the trunk shipped over on the next boat. Uh, the ocean liner probably landed in Washington, where Natalie's mother lived in the winter. From there, the women would have boarded the Bar Harbor Express, which was a cracked train that originated in Washington and communicated between several major cities on the East Coast, um, as well as the fashionable summer resorts. The train went through Ellsworth over to Hancock Point, where the two women would board a steamer to take them across Frenchman's Bay to Bar Harbor. There was no land bridge to the island in 1900. The name of the steamer was, coincidentally, the Sappho, and Sappho was the legendary poet from the Greek island of Lesbos who celebrated the love and desire between women. Ironically, Renee was translating the poetry of Sappho during her visit. So here is a photo of Bar Harbor in 1900. The eastern section of the Lesbian History Trail starts in Grant Park at the end of Albert Meadow Road on the shore path because here one can get a taste of what turn-of-the-century millionaire homes were like in 1900. Bar Harbor had been discovered by wealthy vacationers around the middle of the 19th century, and by, 19, by 1880, that's 20 years before Natalie and Renee got there, the town had become the summer resort of the rich and famous rivaling Newport, Rhode Island. There were 30 glamorous hotels and estates of grandeur called cottages along the shoreline, these cottages were built for many of the wealthy industrialists of the era, including the Rockefellers, Vanderbilts, Roosevelts, Morgans, DuPonts, Proctors, Livingston, Fords, Pulitzers, and Astors. So this is what the shore path would have looked like back then. And here's another turn-of-the-century postcard view of the shore path. And here's a house they would have walked past. It's Kinarden Lodge, and it would have been eight years old in 1900. The Kinarden would be torn down later in 1958. And the Kinarden is owned by a relative of Charlotte Baker. We'll be talking about her later. And this is the breakwater, originally known as the Cane Cottage. Today, it is a bed and breakfast. This was built in 1904 a few years after Renee and Natalie's summer. Um, it was built for John Jacob Astor's grandson. Here it is today. And this is a building that might look somewhat familiar. It is the original Mount Desert Reading Room. Today, in the same location, is the Reading Room Restaurant, which is part of the Bar Harbor Inn. You can see that it has been designed to replicate the architecture of the original reading room. So let's go back and take a second look because this is a big part of um, Natalie's heritage. The Mount Desert reading room appears to have had a huge influence on Natalie and her major contribution to the European modernist culture. The first social club to be organized on the island was started in 1874 and it was named the Oasis Club. It was a very exclusive men's club built by and for the likes of the male Vanderbilts, Pulitzers, and Morgans. After brief stays in rented buildings, the club moved into its own quarters in 1887, newly incorporated as the Mount Desert Reading Room, with the avowed purpose of promoting literary and social culture. So the reading room had been around for 13 years by the time Natalie and Renee stepped off the deck of the Sappho and onto the pier across from it. It was a key feature of the Bar Harbor landscape, both geographically and culturally. Natalie's father would, of course, been a member, but membership was barred to Natalie. Women could not be members until 1921. The reading room made a significant impression on Natalie. She did not like hearing no, and she had already noticed that a lot of the rules for women were designed to hamper them, like riding side saddle. In fact, the summer before she showed up in Bar Harbor with Renee, she made a point of ditching the side saddle and riding her horse astride, as the men did. 
this uh, this reading room was a real burr under the saddle, you might say, for Natalie. A tomboy since childhood, she did not like these rules for women. She was enormously social, and yet here was this hub of culture, and she was not allowed. And the reading room was more than just a club for men. It was a club for the most wealthy and powerful men in the world. Many of the members were enormous cultural philanthropists, founding and funding libraries and arts organizations. Deals were made here. Politics were discussed at the reading room, and not just discussed, because these men had the leverage to get laws passed or to get their candidates elected. It was a national and international nexus of power, and women could not even cross the threshold. Was there a connection between Natalie's frustration with the reading room and her founding of one of the most famous social salons in the world? Well, let's see. Nine years after she and Renee visited Bar Harbor, Natalie opened her salon in her home in Paris at 20 Rue Jacob. Today, this is one of the most well-known addresses in the city. From 1909 to 1972, from four to eight on every Friday evening that Barney was in town, these members of the Parisian literati and avant-garde could be found partaking of generous offerings of pastries, sandwiches, libations, alcoholic and otherwise, and above all, conversation. The number of guests ranged from 30 to 35, up to 200 for special events. 60 years. I was actually 20 years old when Natalie closed her salon. Natalie's salon was not for everyone. You had to be invited or a guest of someone who was invited, but it was not exclusive. By the time the salon ended, its visitors had included bisexual, lesbian, and gay cultural figures and artists, rich and poor, including authors Colette, Andre Gide, Gertrude Stein, Juna Barnes, and Truman Capote, dancer Isadora Duncan, bookseller Sylvia Beach, Heterosexual luminaries included Paul Claudel, Auguste Rodin, Rainier Maria Rilke, uh, Rabindranath Tagore, sorry if I'm butchering these, James Joyce, Anatole France, Ezra Pound, Paul Valere, and Gabrielle D'Annunzio. Then in 1927, Natalie opened her Académie des Femmes, that is the Academy of Women. This was an organization to lift up women writers. Women members would gather to read the works of selected women and to celebrate them. And this was also a form of protest against male clubs. This was a specific response to the all-male writers club, the Académie Française. It's an interesting side note that the first woman writer allowed into the Académie Française was another lesbian from Mount Desert Island, Marguerite Yourcenar, a French expatriate living in Northeast Harbor. Yes, she's on the lesbian history trail, and you can actually make appointments in the summer, I believe, to visit the home. In 1980, the Academy voted her in, telling her, I will not hide from you, Madame, the fact that you are not here today because you're a woman. It's because you are a great writer. Kind of a little left-handed compliment. In any event, back to 20 Rue Jacob, so this is the backyard, and that structure was called the Temple of Friendship. That is where Natalie in her, that's Natalie in the photograph. She's in her 70s. The Temple of Friendship was built around 1810 for a secret society, probably the Freemasons. So right from the start, it was intended for meetings that could not be held publicly. Natalie, of course, used it for her plays, often about love between women. And here's a photo taken in front of the Temple of Friendship featuring some all-female Isadora Duncan-style dancing, barefoot and in tunics. One of her neighbors wrote how her backyard was kind of like some sort of aquarium. <laughs> I love that. But let's leave Paris and get back to the shore path in Bar Harbor. Let's head into town. So this is the Louisburg Hotel. This is one of the places where uh, she went she attended a ball with Renee. <clears throat> the Louisburg Hotel was noted on the south side of Atlantic Avenue. Originally built in 1870, it burned down a year later and it was rebuilt. This is what it looked like around the summer of 1900. 
1939, it was demolished and the land was divided into three building lots. Natalie and Renee, <clears throat> whose evening gowns finally arrived, attended the balls given in hotels like the Louis Berg. And at these balls, Natalie and Renee would dance together. Now remember, the summer people all had known Natalie for 10 years. They watched her grow up. And the previous year, she had showed up riding like a man, ditching the side saddle. So now she shows up and she's dancing like a man with another woman. Um, so they smiled, they kind of shook their head and rolled their eyes. Oh, that Natalie, that scamp. But Renee got completely different treatment. She was the little tart that Natalie had brought over from Paris. The women cut her socially. And what that means is if she was crossing a room, they would turn their backs. They wouldn't speak to her. The men, of course, would all ask her to dance because it's obvious that a woman who dances with another woman was probably up for anything. Bar Harbor Society was a nightmare in 1900 for Renee. And she wrote a poem uh, about it. It's a poem titled Pillory. And I am going to read a translation of it. Pillory by Renee Vivienne. For a long time I was chained to the pillory. Women saw my suffering and laughed at me. Then men hurled clouds of mire from the street, which spattered on my temple and my cheek. Tears rose up, a throbbing undertow, but I choked back the sobbing in my throat. I saw them there as though a fearful dream, whose terrors lengthen and whose horrors teem. The place was public. All were coming to see. The women flung their giggling at me. They threw their rotten fruits. They chanted sneering songs. The wind tore vicious whispers toward me in my bonds. Their rage invaded and their feet appalled. In silence there, I learned to hate them all. Their insults stung as though a nettle's lash. When they unchained me, I was free at last. I was free to follow where the north wind led. Since then, I've borne the visage of the dead. And that is translated by Samantha Pius. So now let's head over to Kibo Street, across from uh, where the Malvern Apartments are today and where the Port Inn Hotel is today. Um, that's, you can see that on the map. We're in downtown um, Bar Harbor now. So these were all rental cottages on Kibo Street that were part of the Malvern Hotel, which was further down Kibo Street. One of these was rented by Renee Vivian and her mother in the summer of 1900. Yes, I was surprised she made this trip with her mother, as well as Natalie. This is the same mother who tried to incarcerate her in the mental asylum seven years earlier. But they did come together, and I was thinking, oh my gosh, how on earth could Renee stand it? But then I remembered the chloral hydrate. So anyway, another view of the Malvern Hotel cottages. Natalie's family lived up the hill behind them, up there where the, uh, the Eyrie is. Um, another view of one of the Malvern Hotel cottages. Um, and this is the Malvern Hotel itself, further down Kibo Street. And that uh, was remodeled later, decades later, and it became as grand as the Louisburg. The Malvern Hotel was burned to the ground in the Great Fire of 1947. More of that later. So uh, that's Kibo Street, and now we're going to swing over to La Rochelle on Cottage Street, which today houses the Bar Harbor Historical Society. The reason we're visiting La Rochelle is because it's the only turn-of-the-century mansion that allows the public inside. It has furniture and exhibits that highlight the gilded age of Bar Harbor. La Rochelle was built in 1903, three years after Natalie and Renee's summer, so again, possibly it was under construction when they were here. Unlike most of the millionaire cottages, La Rochelle was built from brick. And here it is today. 
and here we see the entrance hall of this cottage. I just, I just love the way they use the cottage for these. So after we leave La Rochelle, let's go up the hill opposite College of the Atlantic to the site of the Barney Cottage. Their home was on Norman Street across from the Atlantic Irie Hotel today. And here it is. Uh, this was the Barney Summer Cottage. It was named Banny Bryn, and it was built in 1888. Like the Malvern Hotel, it also burned down in the fire of 47. It was one of the 70 uh, large cottages that burned. Rising to four stories, the home consisted of 27 rooms, including seven bedrooms, five bathrooms, five fireplaces, a large stable, seven servants' bedrooms, and additional servants' facilities. The top floor was reserved as a studio space for Ms. Barney and her artistic pursuits. Banny Brin's exterior was constructed of granite. The interior featured exotic hardwoods and materials and was furnished with antiques acquired by the Barneys during their global travels. Here's a good photo of Banny Bryn and the side that overlooked Bar Harbor, south facing. What I love about this house is how much it exploits the view. As you can see in this picture, there are two round towers that consist of open air porches on every floor all the way up. Well, maybe that one's enclosed on the top right, but all right, here's another view, and you can see that tower of porches. Um, and this looks like um, this is a, a slightly blurry image of Natalie's mother at Banny Bryn. I think she's on the top floor of that tower where the porch is kind of also a little bit like a balcony. And here she is on a lower porch uh, with her dogs. This is an old postcard of six of these, quote, cottages. Banny Bryn is in the center at the top. And again, you can see one of these tower, towers full of porches. So this is a studio portrait of Natalie around the time of her visit. So um, the two women fought over the drugs. They fought over the parties. They fought over Natalie's interest in other women. So what happened to them after this summer in Bar Harbor that was so tumultuous? They went back to Paris where they had separate apartments. This is another portrait of Renee, slightly older. Renee seemed to have a kind of melancholic goth aesthetic. I kind of imagine her with a sleeve tattoo, nose piercings, and wearing nothing but black if she was a young person today. And here she is wearing her Siamese cats as shoulder pads or something. Um, another photo of Renee, again, with the dark, romantic, mysterious robes. One thing that stood out to me in this photo, which seems to be a picture of her in her 30s, early 30s, is how much this dress is hiding her body. Renee developed a very severe eating disorder um, in her late 20s, and this kind of dress may have been hiding that. By the summer of 1901, when Natalie traveled again to the U.S., their relationship was completely over, and Renee never went back to Bar Harbor. A few years later, as many lesbians uh, before and after them have done, they became lovers again, dramatically moving together to the town of Mytilene on the Greek island of Lesbos. Their dream was to found a women's arts colony near the home of the ancient poet Sappho. This attempt at reconciliation was mostly instigated by Natalie, and it didn't last very long. Um, Rene soon fled back to her former lover, the wealthy French writer, Eline Van Zuylen. She was never intimately involved with Natalie again, and she died only five years later of complications from alcoholism, abuse of chloral hydrate, and anorexia at the age of 31. On the day of her death, uh, coincidentally, Natalie went to her apartment, unaware that Renee had even been so gravely ill. Renee's family was there, and they would not let even Natalie in even to see the body, feeling she had been a ruinous influence in her short life. 
In fairness, though, I do think that many folks with drug-addicted family members are not fond of the addict's friends and often feel that they are responsible for, um, for the addiction and the outcome of that. It was a very tragic ending to an unusual intimacy. Renee is recognized today as one of France's most gifted poets, and the power of her poetry comes across even in translation. What happened to Natalie? She went on to live into her 90s. So this is Natalie, possibly in her 30s, around the time of Renee's death. Natalie in her 40s, this was painted by her sister. Natalie had many, many lovers. That was kind of one of the issues. When she was in her 40s, she became partners with lesbian painter Romaine Brooks, and the two would remain together for 40 years. In her 80s, Natalie began an affair with the wife of a retired Romanian ambassador. Romaine, also in her 80s, had had enough and she left. Romaine uh, did many portraits of her friends and many of these were lesbians. This is an interesting portrait titled Peter, a young English girl. Now today, Peter would probably identify as a trans man or a lesbian butch. But as we see by the title, back in the day, Peter was just called a young English girl. And here's a kind of ghoulish self-portrait that Romaine did. Uh, and, and Romaine and Natalie, that's Natalie on the right. And Natalie in a cape, still, still the dramatic dresser. Natalie in her 70s. Natalie's salon was put on hold only during World War II when she moved to Italy to wait out the war. And I'm very sorry to say that Barney aligned herself with the fascists during the war. She had a Jewish grandfather, and there's some who theorize she was only trying to protect herself. After all, she was in her 80s, and Nazi soldiers would periodically march through her home in Paris looking for Americans. The danger to her was real. I don't think uh, anyone will ever know why she and Romaine made a choice to go, go to Italy, but that is what they did. After the war, Natalie returned to Paris and reopened her salon, which was now filled with folks from the famous Lost Generation. All these decades, Natalie had been renting this house, but in the late 60s, new owners purchased her home and began a gut renovation, despite protestations from Barney and history-loving Parisians. Barney died in a hotel in 1972, 95 years old. Her life had spanned first wave feminism, which began in the mid-1800s, to the women's liberation movement of the 1960s. I like to remember Matt, Natalie as she was in that summer of 1900. And one of my favorite pictures of her was taken by Renee or by their friend Eva Palmer at Duck Brook. So here is where we leave Natalie Barney in the glory of her youth, defying society and its misogyny and its homophobia, embracing nature and the wild beauty of Acadia by Duck Brook. So now it's time to visit another lesbian couple whose summer home was in Bar Harbor. So this is the story of Clara B. Spence and Charlotte Baker. And this is a blurry photo of them with two of their adopted children. And it is, I'm sorry to say it's the only photo I could find. Sorry for the blur. Clara B. Spence was like uh, Natalie, a force of nature. And in her own way, she was herself a rebel. Clara was an educator, a women's and civil rights advocate, an adoption pioneer, and a civic leader. She is an important overlooked woman who was a major player in the political, educational, business, and social arenas during the Gilded Age in New York. She was a contemporary of some of the most famous women in American history, including Helen Keller and Edith Wharton, both of whom she knew personally. Yet it is rare for Clara to show up on lists of notable American women, maybe because she was a lesbian and maybe because she was in one of the first single-sex adoptive families. Clara Spence was born in Albany, New York in 1862. Her parents were ethnic Scots born in Ireland. That is to say her family were Protestants in a Catholic country. 
They escaped the grinding poverty of the potato famine and an epidemic of scarlet fever that claimed the lives of six of their seven children by sailing to America in the late 1850s. So I want you to file that away. Before Clara was born, her family had had seven children, six of whom had died, possibly in the same week. And then they immigrated to a country that had huge prejudice against the Irish. That is a lot of trauma and tragedy to inherit, especially around the vulnerability of children and the heartache of losing them. That's going to have a lot to do with Clara Spence's life. Anyway, shortly after her parents arrived in New York, their daughter Clara was born, and within a few years the father died. Clara was a strong-willed child raised by a single mother in the mid-19th century. In, 19, in 1873, she entered the Free Academy, Albany's first high school, where she quickly gained a reputation as a persuasive public speaker. When she turned 17, Clara began what was likely her first lesbian relationship with Jessie Prentice, an older woman who was part of Albany's social aristocracy. Recorded only in Clara's letters to Jessie, whom she addresses as my precious Miss Prentice, she signs with love and a French kiss, I am your own girl. Their intimate relationship lasted 20 years. During this time, Clara left New York to spend two years at the School of Oratory at Boston University. Following her graduation from this school, Clara performed recitations of poetic and theatrical works in Boston, New York, and Albany, receiving general critical acclaim. She had similar success when she traveled to London in 1881 to try out her skills on British audiences, reporting back on her experience in affectionate letters to Jessie. In London and in New York, after she returned in 1882, Clara was sorely tempted to go beyond public recitals to acting in stage plays. Jessie, possibly driven by the dismal view of the acting profession among members of high society, was firmly opposed. Clara eventually gave up her acting aspirations in favor of the more socially acceptable occupation of school teacher. She and Jessie moved to Brooklyn, a Brooklyn townhouse together, and Clara began to teach elocution and soon branched out to other subjects. Around this time, Clara developed the deep concern for the welfare of abandoned children that would become so central to her later life. When uh, she and Jessie became aware of two young siblings, Alice and Arthur, whose parents had died, Clara and Jessie took them in and eventually became their legal guardian, guardians. It's interesting to note they did not adopt them. That was not a socially acceptable practice among the upper classes. In 1892, Clara, who was then 33, opened her own school for girls in Midtown Manhattan buoyed by a rising dissatisfaction among young upper-class women who are beginning to openly aspire to more than wealth and social acceptance, the Spence School rapidly gained success. Her students included the daughter of Andrew Carnegie and the great-granddaughters of Cornelius Vanderbilt. It tells us a lot about Clara's determination that she, the daughter of poor immigrants, would become the head of a school for the children of wealthy industrialists. Clara believed in exposing her students to the major artists, writers, leaders, and thinkers of the era, especially women. She hired Isadora Duncan, a bisexual and a communist, to teach interpretive dance to her students, and she invited Helen Keller to talk through her interpreter, Ann Sullivan. Many people don't realize this, but Helen Keller was a huge advocate for socialism. As part of her campaign to encourage social conscience and activism, Clara invited some of her radical friends to speak to her classes, including novelist Edith Wharton and settlement house pioneer Lillian Wald, both of whom were known to have intimate relationships with women. When Booker T. Washington came to New York City to raise money for the Tuskegee Institute, which he had founded in 1881 in Tuskegee, Alabama, it was an institute to educate black teachers. When he came to New York, he spoke at his friend Clara's school and stuck around to dine with the girls afterwards. For many, this may well have been the first time in their adult lives they ever ate at a table with a person of color. So let's meet Charlotte Baker. 
Charlotte Sanford Baker was born in 1858 in Elizabeth, New Jersey, one of seven children. Growing up, Charlotte was often responsible for caring for her younger siblings, and like Clara, she developed a deep empathy for abandoned children. Her grandfather helped found New York University, and her uncle was a railroad magnet and philanthropist who encouraged his niece's altruistic instincts and left her the considerable fortune of almost $2 million when he died. By the way, her uncle was John Stuart Kennedy, and he had one of the first cottages on the shore path. Remember Kennardon? So Charlotte Baker met Clara in 1897, five years after Clara founded the Spence School. Both women were in their early 40s. Charlotte must have recounted the scene fondly and repeatedly to her adopted daughter Ruth, as Ruth later described it, quote, This meeting was remembered with great vividness by Miss Baker as Miss Spence came forth to meet her carrying a large armful of American Beauty roses. Her penetrating and sparkling blue eyes and a purposeful walk dramatically impressed Miss Baker, and so these two remarkable ladies met, end quote. I love the purposeful walk part. Meanwhile, Jesse and Clara's 20-year relationship was beginning to unravel. There was a 12-year age difference, and the daughter they had raised together had died from diphtheria. And then there was Jesse's social conservatism and Clara's growing progressivism. As Clara and Charlotte grew closer, Clara separated from Jesse. And Jesse wore black and mourned the loss like death. Now, at first, I thought that was kind of a drama queen thing to do, to act like someone's died when your partner leaves you. But then I thought about it more deeply. Now, these two women had been together for 20 years, ever since Clara was 17. They had raised two children together. They had gone through the death of one of the children together. Jesse had bankrolled all of Clara's dreams, except going on the stage. It was Jessie's money that paid for her professional training for the initial outlay of capital for her school. It was Jessie's social contacts that enabled Clara to attract the children of the wealthy and the powerful to her school. They absolutely would have married each other if it had been an option. And now Clara was just packing her bags and leaving. In the eyes of the law and in society, it was a non-event. But in Jessie's life, it was a massive catastrophe. It was like a death in the family. It was like a divorce. She probably felt like many women who set their dreams aside to put their husbands through school and so on, only to find themselves left for another woman. So when I really thought about it and um, how much Jesse made Clara's dreams come true, um, I feel a new respect in her wearing black and making it very public that she was mourning the loss of her partnership. She was kind of forcing um, people to deal with the fact that, you know, it was um, a life partnership she was losing. Anyway, here's an official portrait of Clara, possibly in her 50s, about 10 years after the breakup. Charlotte soon came to live and teach at the Spence School. Charlotte provided not only money, but emotional and professional support to Clara. Although Charlotte was much shyer than Clara, she carved out her own place in the hearts of the students who described her as having a wonderful sense of humor and the kindest heart that ever beat. While Clara was the boss, Charlotte was the shadow of Miss Spence, a comfy soul. Those are quotations. Clara's zeal made an indelible impression on her students, one of whom described her as frighteningly adorable. I think that's an interesting phrase. In 1899, two years after the women met, Charlotte's mother and Clara bought vacation homes next door to each other in the quiet community of Sorrento, Maine. Clara named hers the Mary Alden Cottage in honor of William Shakespeare's mother. When there, Clara, Charlotte, and the other bakers hobnobbed with wealthy vacationers, hosted parties, and volunteered at the Sorrento Library. Leveraging Charlotte's business skills and her Uncle John's wealthy connections, Clara was able to ensure continued financial support for the Spence School. And just as a side note, uh, Jane Adams, who also had a summer place in Bar Harbor, 
She used to say she could raise more money in the summer in Bar Harbor than she could all year in Chicago. All right, let's take a look at the Spence School, which is still flourishing today. Gwyneth Paltrow and Kerry Washington, both actors, uh, graduated from Spence. It is on the Upper East Side, two blocks from Central Park. It's close to the Metropolitan Museum, the Zoo, the Museum of Modern Art, the Lincoln Center. Now, granted, when it was founded, it was 1892, but still, what an incredible location, um, just a cultural treasure house. So here's the front door of the lower school, and here's the front door of the upper school. And in the early days, uh, Spence was a boarding school, or at least had that option. And here is a dormitory suite with two rooms and two beds in each room. From the bobbed hair, this looks like it's probably the 1920s. The Spence school no longer has the boarding option and is entirely for day students. The current tuition is $54,000 a year. More bobbed hair. This looks like a high school science lab. And here's an early theater production. And note the uh, literal footlights. And here's a ballet class for the little ones. Basketball. Note the bloomers. Also, I love the glass windows on the basketball court. Um, and this is the class of 1953 at an alumni event newly married and one of them in maternity clothes. That's so 1950s, isn't it? Uh, a mid-Manhattan girls athletic field. Two years ago, uh, I think it was 19, it's 2020 or 2021, the Spence School Athletics Program got a massive upgrade. Yeah, it was in 2021. The Spence School completed this 65,000 square foot, six story building on East 90th Street. And this was the new home for Spence athletics, performing arts, entrepreneurship, student life, and a K through 12 ecology and interdisciplinary learning program. This is uh, amazing when you consider we're talking about Midtown Manhattan. And here's a picture of a recent class of Spence girls. In a recent study, Spence ranked the sixth most successful school in the country in placing its graduates in Harvard, Yale, and Princeton. But in a commencement speech, Clara admonished the daughters of privilege that were her students, quote, for a single one of you to be selfish and self-indulgent, to be cowardly, with no aim in life, would be nothing less than a tragedy. End quote. Clara Spence achieved her work during the pivotal decades 1900 to 1920 when there were many people with socially progressive ideas. Some approached the property of the, the problem of the discrepancy between the rich and the poor working from the bottom up. They personally went into the slums and worked with the problem firsthand, as we will see with Jane Addams and Hull House. Clara Spence chose to approach the problem from the top down by teaching the children of the most powerful New Yorkers the moral and ethical virtue of service so that they in their adult life would make a difference in improving the conditions of those less fortunate. The Spence School curriculum provided an education beyond the borders of the classroom, an education that was designed by a lesbian daughter of immigrants whose family had suffered the stigma of prejudice, the horrors of colonization, and the suffering of poverty. But Clara Spence did more than just founding an amazing school that is still thriving today. She also pioneered reform in the area of adoption, personally and professionally. Let's take a look. Adoption, which today we take for granted, was an anomaly at the turn of the century. To adopt a non-relative was considered a brave and bizarre act and also risky because of genetic uncertainty and social stigma. Clara Spence dedicated herself to the cause of abandoned inf infants and she introduced her students to adoption as a new and fulfilling form of social work. By her willingness to defy public opinion and risk social ostracism, 
Clara Spence not only managed to make adoption an accepted practice, but one that became the method of choice for hundreds of families. During the 1950s, there were thousands of children uh, living on the streets of several major cities. The children were in search of food, shelter, and money, and they sold rags, matches, and newspapers just to survive. The children formed gangs for protection because life on the street was dangerous, and they were regularly victimized, and I guess I would add probably trafficked. The police often arrested the children, some as young as five years old, and put them in lockup facilities with adult criminals. Determined to remedy the situation, the Children's Aid Society and the New York Founding Hos Foundling Hospital devised a program to take children off the streets of New York and Boston and place them in homes in the American West, rather than allow them to continue to be arrested and taken advantage of on the streets. Because the children were transported by train to their new homes, the, ter the term orphan trains began to be used. The thought was that orphanages were overcrowded and gloomy places that did not teach children to become productive and functioning adults who could take care of themselves. The Children's Aid Society took the position that a strong family life could help these victimized and neglected children, and knowing that the American pioneers who were settling the West could use help, they felt that placing children within these families would be mutually beneficial. In theory, the children would be taken in and treated as memory, members of the family. And probably that did happen occasionally, but away from their families of birth and without any oversight, it's also probable that many of these children were abused and exploited. And again, trafficked. The children often had no idea where they were going and were only told they were going to take a train ride. Often the children had local families in prison or in hospitals or just temporarily unable to provide support for them. It didn't matter. They were still put on the orphan train. So here's an account from a survivor of the orphan train. I just finished eating and this matron came by and tapped us along the head. You're going to Texas. You're going to Texas. Well, some of the kids, you know, clapped and laughed. And when she came to me, I looked up and I said, well, I can't go. I'm not an orphan. My mother's still living. She's in a hospital right here in New York. You're going to Texas. There's no use arguing. And that was um, Hazel Latimer. Finally, in 1909, President Roosevelt sponsored the first White House Conference on Dependent Children. This was the beginning of the movement for modern day adoptions. One month after this conference, Clara Spence personally adopted a one-year-old girl from the Children's Aid Society. The judge had no objection to her application, even though she was a single parent nearing the age of 50. Six years later, in 1915, Clara Spence adopted a little boy. Her partner, Charlotte, adopted a girl in 1911 and a boy in 1914, completing what, what was one of the first single-sex adoption families even though they weren't allowed to adopt as a family. They each adopted two kids. Sorry again for the blurriness. This is Clara and Charlotte with their two daughters. Clara and Charlotte not only organized their own adoptions, in 1910 they started a nursery for orphaned and abandoned babies and launched one of the earliest adoption agencies which pioneered international as well as domestic adoptions. Now, this is Clara in Central Park, probably with some of the very young children from her school. One of the radical ideas that Clara had was to open a nursery on the top floor of the Spence School where the infants and toddlers could be cared for during the period of time between when they were relinquished and the time they were adopted out. And she had an ideal situation because she could recruit the students. They were all in the same building some of whom were actually boarding and they could do night shifts for the care of these babies. And also in return, the girls would be learning parenting and homemaker skills. The children were in a situation where they were held and played with constantly by a number of young women, um, students, but also recent alumni of the school. The trauma of separation from the birth mother was eased by this period of time where they were, were the center of attention around the clock with consistent and quality care. 
um, medical, nutritional needs fully met. Today, children in foster care go from one family to the next with no time to heal or process the changes in their lives. Not surprisingly, as trauma compounds um, and their chances of thriving begin to diminish um, with each new placement. Because of her school, Spence had this unusual situation. She had a huge resource of unpaid labor, unpaid and eager labor because the girls really enjoyed uh, their time playing with these babies and toddlers. Those conditions don't exist in adoption agencies today, but I just think it was a really enlightened um, perspective and one that really was very centered on the needs of these infants that were separated from their mothers, um, often at birth, but sometimes later. Spence's approach to adoption was centered on the child's experience. That was a radical idea when orphans from low-income families were considered burdens on the system and lucky for any care they could get. It was Ms. Spence's personal involvement that inspired her students who witnessed the transformation of babies who came from institutions and were built up for adoption on the top floor of her school. As a result, in 1915, the alumni of the school opened the Spence Alumni Society Nursery, through which several hundred babies were placed in adoptive homes. In 1943, the Spence Nursery merged with another nursery in Manhattan, founded by Dr. Henry and Alice Chapin, and the Spence Chapin Services to Families and Children was formed. The organization continues to serve the needs of children of all creeds, colors, and nationalities today. So this is a picture of their current board. You can see in the picture their strong commitment to diversity. The woman in the red sweater is Clara's granddaughter, Martha Heck Ullman, who wrote a biography of her famous grandmother titled A Power for Good. Today, Spence Chapin is on the cutting edge of the best practices for adoption. They offer ongoing support for adoptive families, including support for open adoption and for transracial families. Clara Chapin, with the support of Charlotte Baker, founded two institutions that continue to thrive more than a century after their founding. That is really an amazing accomplishment. These institutions still reflect the values of an immigrant's daughter with a passion for serving children and the skills to inspire generations to perpetuate her vision. So where was their home on the lesbian history tour? Well, it was uh, up the road. Uh, it was at a place called the Willows, which today is still called the Willows and is part of Atlantic Oceanside Hotel. It's on Route 3, just past the College of the Atlantic. In 1913, Charlotte used some of her wealth to build the Willows, a 27-room vacation home in Bar Harbor, which the Bar Harbor Record described as one of the most interesting and attractive cottages in the area. The Willows was a comfortable and gracious design in a modified Regency style set on rolling lawns at the edge of an ocean bluff. Here, Charlotte and Clara spent summers pleasantly, entertaining the many Spence alumna who summered nearby painting in the mornings in her large conservatory, that's Charlotte, giving musicals and visiting her aunt's fortress-like cottage, Kinarden Lodge. And their children would sometimes be joined by children from the orphanage up at the Willows. And here's another view of the home back in the day. And here it is from the side. Clara remained the head of the Spence School for 31 years until her death in 1923 from complications of breast cancer. Charlotte took over as headmistress until 1929. She continued to summer in Bar Harbor with her children until her death in 1932. After Charlotte's death, the Willows was sold to wealthy philanthropist Sir Harry Oakes. The land and the building later were bequeathed to Bowdoin College after the fire of 1947. In 1969, the Coff family bought the property and the Willow Mansion was restored in 2008. So this is what the Willows looks like today as a motel. And this is a somewhat older photograph showing the Willows is surrounded, being surrounded by motels and hotels. Now, back in the day, this all was part of what was called Millionaire's Row. Uh, 
But after the fire, um, which swept through the area, um, the developer, it, it didn't burn, it didn't burn the willows, but a lot of the property around here burned. Um, and the developers moved in and they began buying up properties. And the acreage, um, the willows had come with quite a bit of acreage. That acreage was um, sold, and uh, obviously from the picture, uh, it was sold to developers. And so this is kind of an enclave of different uh, motels. So I didn't get to talk about the other two lesbians in Bar Harbor who are on the tour. That's Jane Adams and her partner, Mary Rose Smith. But their summer home was up on Lookout Point, and you can go to the website to read about them. Um, and I built the tour so that you could sort of make a day of it. And it does a scenic loop that goes around and includes the stone barn on Crooked Road. Um, the first barn and the present house were built in 1840. Um, and that was around the time Jane Addams was born. Uh, a late 19th century photograph shows a two-story house, some connecting buildings, and a wooden barn. Though the house still stands, the connecting buildings and the barn have been replaced by the stone barn and the carriage house. So this just uh, gives an idea of how the year-round residents were living um, while these very wealthy summer people were coming up just for the season. And then uh, the tour swings around to the Duck Brook Bridge over Duck Brook, where um, Natalie uh, posed, as we saw, in the summer of 1900. So that if you're on the tour, you can get out here and have a walk around Witch Hole Pond. And the end of the tour is at um, the Kibo um, the Kibo Country Club, which was, um, it burned in 1947, but was rebuilt on the same site. As you can see, this is kind of a turn of the century postcard. This would have been the era um, when Natalie and Renee were visiting, and you can see the building is in the same space. So that is the end of our um, the first part of the Lesbian History Trail of Mount Desert Island. Thank you all so much. I encourage you to Google the Lesbian History Trail of Mount Desert Island and you can read about 12 more of the women, fascinating women who are on the tour.